Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. This is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and sometimes the reporting of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Ndoro and this is what's coming up on the show today. We'll be exploring the many new ways news is now being distributed to audiences with the advent of social media and smartphones. Platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp and YouTube have created a number of new mediapreneurs and we catch up with two of them, one here in South Africa and another one in Zimbabwe. Now with the digital disruption, citizen journalism has grown exponentially, sadly though not always with the best consequences as many don't even know or realize that they are doing this form of journalism. We find out what uh, some of these consequences are and what should be done to make sure that citizen reporting is seen without hurting anyone. In our News and History feature this week, we take you back to 1996, and that's the year we first celebrated Heritage Day. So that's the show, but remember, you can always engage with us on social media using the Twitter handle, hashtag SABC Media Monitor. And also, you can share your views with us on our WhatsApp number, and that's 065-862-4548. That's 65 862-4548. Right, before we get into those uh, highlighted stories on the program, let's first take a look at uh, what's on the front pages of our Sunday newspapers this morning, because most of you get your media there, don't you? Uh, uh, newspapers and social media. But let's start with the, the newspapers, and we start with the Sunday Times, which uh, leads with this tragic story of uh, a leading uh, detective who was assassinated in the Western Cape. Police have unleashed an intense operation across Cape Town to trace the three hitmen that were seen on security camera footage running away from the scene of Colonel Charles Kinnear's uh, murder outside his home on Friday. Questions though have been raised by amongst others the police minister as to why Kinnear's protection had been withdrawn. The City Press leads with what it's calling the corrupt list, referring to those accused of wrongdoing in a list of names submitted to the ANC. Well, they're refusing to step aside, deciding instead to take legal action against the party. So that cleanup campaign uh, struggling a little bit. The Sunday Independent, well, that top story refers to Kosatu and the South African Communist Party accusing Limpopo Premier Stan Matabata of uh, failing to fight corruption in the province and ceding power to a faction. The two bodies are demanding that he steps down. The Sunday Tribune's headline reads that South Africa needs to get used to the new normal as the country moves to alert level one. Uh, this will happen tonight at midnight. Uh, despite having weathered a COVID-19 storm, there's still a threat of a second wave of infection if people don't adhere to the precautions uh, that are needed. The Weekend Argus on Sunday, good to see that paper back. Well, that sees the union calls for the removal of UCT Vice-Chancellor Mamkhete Bageng. Uh, the country's largest public sector union wants her fired for being silent on fresh allegations of racism and bullying at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. And this is a, a training hospital for UCT. Now, how have questioned uh, Pageng's uh, perceived silence on racism and sexism uh, taking place? And the Sunday world is leading with socialite Kanyim Bao, who looks like she may have run herself into a bit of financial problems trying to keep up her bling lifestyle. The paper's reporting that Standard Bank is demanding that she surrender a Porsche and a Merc. She says, though, it's all a misunderstanding between her and a lender. All right, so those are your newspapers. Uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, some of the issues that are playing out on social media, Twitter to be specific. This is what is trending. And that's the list for this week. The Sacred Space is always uh, there. It's uh, a program on Radio Metro and uh, very popular with people. Sunday Feels is another one that uh, people just share their thoughts and feel blessed on a Sunday. Uh, the one I'm picking up though is number four and that's uh, Becky Trele who's been on a mission uh, going around making sure that things are 
uh, uh, as they should be. And uh, a lot of people are saying, but hang on, Sunnyside, Hillbrow, Kempton Park, Joburg CBD didn't become criminal hotspots overnight. It wasn't always like this. Where was the police when crime slowly took over these metros? Where was the energy Begitele uh, had on alcohol during level five lockdown? So people are saying that uh, all these missions that he has patrolling in various areas are great, but he should have had the same energy that he had with alcohol on level five uh, on the, dealing with uh, the hotspots. Uh, Malum Siswe says, I saw like 15 police vehicles, Veshaya uh, Ekonvoy, earlier Etogoza. That's good, I guess, but why can't you all put the same energy into Hillbrow, Rosettenville, and so on? All right, so that's uh, what's uh, trending on social media as of a short while ago. Uh, we have a lot to come, so fasten your seatbelts. Uh, coming up, we start taking a look at unconventional ways to distribute the news. Welcome back, you're still watching Media Monitor. Now, mass media has always been a contested space, even though the number of players was always limited because of the massive investments usually required. But the digital era has brought with it huge disruption, and now reaching mass audiences is no longer the preserve of traditional and established media. Social media platforms have become a new and unfettered source of news and entertainment. This has seen the emergence of many new mediapreneurs creating their own channels and media outlets. You can see the new formats on spaces like uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, amongst others. And so now even the messaging app uh, WhatsApp is being used as a platform to disseminate news to audiences even beyond borders. Well, today we're going to be speaking to two such uh, new media uh, printers. One is the founder of a Facebook uh, 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 anchored Captain SABC Livour Online TV. And uh, uh, just before I introduce the other one, we caught up with some of the channel's uh, viewers uh, to find out why they are subscribers. What do I like about uh, SABC Livour is that uh, his heart, uh, his humanity, like he can touch someone's heart by giving something like for instance food clothes a house so that thing is is so touching so uh, we have, we learn humanity we learn to give we learn uh, to share what we have from the small we have so that's what i like about him and we really love him i thank you Hi, I'm Marco Kamatozi. What I've learned about Captain Yosebi is uh, you don't have to be a millionaire to, to help other people. Um, Livu Dimutu Ane or Hasla, Livu Hai Deli, Livu Diko Geta, and then even if Anna offer a plate of Busha, she was on your page, Sarah Mutinwa, we are wanted about Asara to ask her and offer a Shikutuku. Then Livu is, is my role model. Now, like many other countries in the world, newspaper circulation is down in Zimbabwe. The media there has other problems too, but uh, the largest daily newspaper there now sells less than 12,000 copies a day. So, where do the 16 million people uh, in the country get credible news? Well, one source is a WhatsApp publication called Kukurigo. It, uh, it seems to have taken off as it now reaches in excess of 370,000 daily readers, far eclipsing all the print newspapers put together. Here's what some of their readers had to say uh, about the WhatsApp news service. Kuguriko has helped me a lot in terms of uncovering what is evil in our society and how to pray for it. I'm really grateful for that. It is also shown some, it is balanced and it presents news in a way that is uh, responsible, it is not inflammatory, it adheres to the ethics of uh, reporting. So I'm really grateful. And that it continues to give us really what is taking place in our country in a way that helps us to see what needs to be corrected, what needs to be healed. I really ben have benefited a lot as a practitioner because I'm a practitioner. I pray for my country. Thank you so much for the service. Kokurigo, 
I think is the best because some of the news we receive through this platform is the best. We, we, we won't receive a, this type of news through our radios or platforms, but Kukurigo, you are there to give us something which is hidden behind us. I like Kukuriko because it gives us prompt news and correct news at the right time. We are very, very informed and we trust the news that you give us and you tell us exactly what is happening. We're telling it as it is. Thank you so much. Keep it up. I'm Ronald. Yeah, I like Kukuriko. I think it's very useful. It's keeping us readers well informed at an affordable cost. At the same time, if you want to, if you are searching for products to purchase, I've seen some adverts which are also useful. All right, so there's some happy viewers and happy readers there uh, in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Well, let's talk to these uh, new age mediapreneurs, uh, Dibuani Madadze, who's uh, also known as SABC Divor in the entertainment industry. He founded Captain SABC Divor Online TV, which you can find on Facebook. And we also have Edmund Kudzai, an investigative journalist and editor of Kukurigo, the WhatsApp news service based, service based in Zimbabwe. Gentlemen, to both of you, a very good morning. Thanks so much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. Morning, Peter. Thank you for having me. All right, SABC Devoa, let's start with you um, because uh, I think a lot of people recognize you as a comedian. <laughs> they don't know that you're also an entrepreneur. <laughs> but let's start with uh, your Facebook uh, uh, online TV channel. What inspired you to start that? Um, what inspired me to start that is that Ndimtuenda uh, Luwesangamanda Ndichifuna media. So, Ufunaanga media. Sayasu, 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 watu wa chidinyaza, sayasu, watu wa uchiko dilinge, zo umbeda palo na palo, reba ufrele, shikara, sayasu, sayasu, kubara, mara, na gumando noto, ditomera online channel ya, na ine ya bori, it's working for me, iko nchumera ngamanda. All right, and uh, you've managed to get quite a number of uh, viewers already. What is on this website that people like? Uh, what people like about my channel is that I bring them the local content. Uh, content in to baba koto do fayo ne ineva relate na yo. And then the vantage kuba pa mapungo maswa maswa ane abori awa asa to sika fe to achisala achia umwe. I'm the one to give them that uh, fresh news uh, from the ground. Okay, all right, we'll get into that a little bit more. Let's cross the border and go to Zimbabwe. And uh, Edmund, you've been, uh, you were an editor one time of a traditional newspaper. Tell us about what's up this news platform. What got you to think about using what's up? I mean, this is very new age. Edmund, can you hear us? Well, it was somewhat inadvertent. Um, yeah. it, yes, I can hear you clearly. Um, it was somewhat uh, inadvertent. We didn't set out to, uh, to create a WhatsApp news service. Initially, we'd done it as an Android and uh, an iOS um, application. Uh, but then about that time, um, some data from the Postal and Telecommunications uh, Regulatory Authority came out. Numbers of people who are using WhatsApp off the chart now at present we have about six million people who are using WhatsApp in Zimbabwe, which gives them access to audio, to video, to text, to PDF, uh, and so on. And you compare that that's uh, that's more than the number of radios and uh, uh, televisions in the country. And uh, as in the new introduction. Uh, we're at a place where the, the largest uh, daily newspaper, which is the Herald, is struggling to sell 12,000 copies a day. And uh, that's being generous partly uh, because of the state of the economy. So people are not getting their news from, uh, from the newspapers. And the best place to, to, to run a newspaper, it became clear to us at the time, was, was in WhatsApp. So just 
before deployment, we then dropped, uh, this is in 2018, we then dropped um, during the election, which was the best time to start the project. <laughs> because you sort of had a captive uh, audience which wanted a credible interview on lectures. So this, we dropped um, Android and iOS applications and then jumped uh, straight into to, to WhatsApp, uh, which was in August, uh, in August of 2018. All right. So people can get their news every morning, uh, updates. Um, how do you make money, though? I mean, you've got 370,000 subscribers. One would think that advertisers are chasing you. Well, no, actually, quite the contrary. Uh, well, we, we haven't really made any money yet, and we don't anticipate that we'll make money anytime soon. We're sort of taking the, the medium-term view, uh, which is that we have uh, a growing leadership which trusts uh, the news that we provide. And there are multiple ways that that can be monetized uh, in the years to come. Uh, the advertisers have not come for two reasons, I suspect. The first is that... Uh, yeah, most of uh, the marketing executives aren't exactly people my age who sort of see it the way that we see it. Uh, so these are guys who cut their teeth when print was gold and children sat excitedly around the radio. So if they sort of hear about an advertising opportunity on WhatsApp, they sort of chuckle and uh, laugh that, oh, why would I want to advertise on, on WhatsApp? But we certainly have the, the, the eyeballs. We, we get some advertising revenue. We run some services within uh, WhatsApp um, for utilities and so on, and so on which, which uh, pays some of the bills, but we, we don't anticipate to be earning any serious revenue, at least not in the next uh, 12 months. All right, and the politics don't help, I guess. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, the, the politics actually, because we've had uh, two fairly large companies uh, that came on to Kukurigo to... to, to uh, to advertise, uh, and uh, they then suddenly pulled out, despite having previously been singing the praises of how effective the service uh, service was. So, so eventually, one of um, one of the executives in the in the company called told one of my my colleagues, um, uh, Farai Machamira, who's the sport editor, that look, we really love the service, but uh, there's been an intervention by the system. So somebody probably phoned and um, discouraged them or persuaded them otherwise. But uh, it's, it's not a major a problem to us because the advertising is, is never really going to be uh, the central source of our revenue. So I suppose we can, uh, we can plod along for, for a few okay. months until we get other things going on. All right. So the truth hurts, it seems. Let's come back to Limpopo. Uh, <laughs> Devo, uh, I just wonder, how do you make money on a platform like yours? Uh, car, on my channel here, we generate money through advertisement and sponsors. Currently, when I'm talking to you, I get an endorsement of a, a car, uh, the Audi. Right now, I'm driving an Audi, which I've got an endorsement from uh, Enrand Insurance. So, we generate money through adverts and sponsors. Uh, some of our adverts are linked to Parapara FM, SABC. Every day, our advert play on uh, Parapara SABC, where the clients come to our, our online channel, and then they request an online marketing, including a radio. So our clients, we join them with any radio that they want. Currently, we are having lots of adverts with uh, Parapara FM. That's how we, we generate our income and through sponsors. All right. And uh, your operation, is it production intensive have you got a lot of people shooting things for you how have you set yourself up uh, currently we don't have equipment we are using phones to capture each and every content that we upload online there on our facebook page captain sbc River online tv and um, instagram uh, youtube and uh, on Twitter. Currently, when I'm talking to you right now, we are also live there on our channel. <laughs> we are using phones. We don't have the equipment currently, but we'll be glad if maybe one of our uh, business around maybe can do something about it and assist uh, our um, dream. Yeah. How because uh, we have a uh, lot of plan and uh, lots of dreams because currently when I'm talking to you, my online channel is able 
to donate two house to the community. This year, we have managed to donate three house from um, different uh, families, whereby we went out and see the, 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 the situation or the condition of the family where they stay in, and then we asked the sponsors to pop in to build the house. Currently, we have three houses which we are building around the community. When it comes to the issue of food parcels, we have a uh, lot of sponsors, including Chief Libwani Matsila, is the one who pushes us in this thing <laughs> of uh, food parcel, where we give different communities the food parcels mm -hmm. and a uh, lot of things. Each and every year, uh, when school reopened, we went to different school. We have the shoe campaign whereby we donate uh, thousands and thousands of shoes to, 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 to different schools. But currently, uh, we, 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 we are achieving those things because of the support that we are getting from the local uh, support from local businesses and my followers for the TWT. All right. So local is lacquer for you. That's what seems to be the formula. <laughs> uh, Edmund, let me come back to you. <laughs> Do you know who your subscribers are? Do you have any idea who they are? And you know, what's the makeup? Is it uh, adults? Is it uh, male? Is it mature? Who's, who's tuning in? Uh, my channel... Uh, no, this is, is for Edmund. I got this is for well, Edmund in Zimbabwe. In. <laughs> yes, oh. yes, Edmund? Yes, it's, um, it really is a mixed bag because the nature of content on, on WhatsApp is, is a very strong forwarding, forwarding culture. So there isn't a paywall. So you find that you have students, you have home keepers on it, um, you have middle-level managers, and you've got cabinet ministers who are using phones that wouldn't show the actual phone number. And uh, I know one permanent secretary is on the platform. So it really is a mixed, a mixed bag, and you can sort of tell that from, from, the, from the engagements. Um, one person is complaining about uh, the Zupco bus service and asking you to write about um, how they're being forced to buy uh, tickets or, or cap cards from, um, that there's a conspiracy to buy cap cards for, from, from, from vendors. Um, and the other person is sort of asking um, about the latest monetary policy statement. So it's quite a mixed bag, but there's no interaction within the platform. So it's just one way, sort of like a newspaper that's yeah. been printed digitally. So these groups don't allow you to comment. That, so that sort of helps because a lot of people are adver adver averse to, to being yeah. grouped. We All right. so we're, we're, running, we're running out of time, is, uh, but I, I, morning, God we're, bless we're, we're running out of time. So, but my last uh, question. That's, that's, uh, yeah. That's sort of the, yeah, we're running out of time. But my last question is, I guess what this has taught us is um, the content is always going to be what's key. How you distribute it and disseminate it is what's changing with technology. Yes, no, I completely agree with you. What matters is, is, is the content, and if the content is, is strong enough, you could just have one group of 256 people, and it would take a life of its own. So the real game is not so much in the distribution app. You could run this on Twitter or on Facebook um, and not have to invest in the website, but as long as you have the strong content, it will, it will take a life of its own. So it's, it's a lot cheaper to do this now than it was the year the goal where you'd have to get out a printing press. Um, now it's, 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 it's much easier with these new technologies. As long as you have strong content, uh, you have, um, um, you have right. a very large audience. Okay. And then final question to you, Devor. Are you going to be bigger than the SABC? <laughs> no, I'm not going to be bigger than the SFBC. The matter is to deliver services to the community. There is a lot of fish in the sea, so uh, there is no way. <laughs> All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, giving us an insight into different ways of uh, distributing news and entertainment and reaching audiences in the way that they need. Thanks so much indeed to both of you. Thank you so much, SFBC, for hosting SFBC Review on SFBC. Great, fantastic.
Lovely chatting to those two gentlemen. So there you have it, different types of media now. It's no longer just us here at the SABC, but uh, YouTubers, TikTokers, uh, WhatsAppers, uh, Facebookers, uh, setting up channels and setting up uh, these uh, distribution points. And it's really about content. And we certainly hope that you're enjoying our content enough to join us again after the break. Now, as we just saw before the break, social media has changed the way that people consume news, where in the past audiences could only receive news from newspapers, radio or television. Well, nowadays, with the help of the internet, people can get instant information from news applications, subscribe, email, as well as uh, social media. <clears throat> this evolution of technology has now allowed anyone with a cell phone, computer, tablets, voice recorders and any other portable device to play an active role in the processing of collecting and reporting, analyz analyzing and disseminating news and information. Sometimes they don't even realize that they're doing it. Well, for more on citizen journalism, its role in society and rules and regulations, we're joined by two people, King Chauke from Kincha Media and... Uh, uh, a broadcast specialist lecturer at the Tswana University of Technology, Tamano Makadi. Let's start with, by greeting you, gentlemen. Welcome. But let me start with you, Tamano. Um, a lot of people don't realize, actually, that every time that they retweet a news item, uh, they're actually publishing. This is citizen journalism. And uh, when they write about something that's happening around them, this is citizen journalism. But sadly, it has had some poor consequences because of that. Tell us about some of the things that you've been concerned with as you've been watching this unfold. No, thank you so much, Peter, and good morning to you and um, all the viewers. Yes, um, citizen journalism uh, plays an important role, but at the same time, um, as traditional media, we have been um, experiencing a couple of uh, problems or challenges here and there by means of um, having, um, you know, some of the content or information having been distorted. So, yes, um, there are problems, um, like you rightfully say. I mean, sometimes you have a situation where uh, stories, sometimes uh, even in mainstream, um, they get to be you know, put up there without having been uh, verified. Sometimes uh, coming from um, uh, uh, you know, citizens themselves, but it is always important, uh, whether it is done by a media house or whether individuals, it is always important to ensure that um, the facts of that particular story have been um, uh, certainly verified. All right. And I, and I guess one of the things that uh, if you are doing citizen media is uh, there are no filters. No one checks what you're doing. And uh, so you may cross lines that you don't even realize that you're crossing, particularly when it comes to sensitive issues like the dignity of a person. No, that's correct. Um, and, 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 and these things happen so, so quick. Um, and but by, by the time you realize it, you actually learn that um, a big mistake has been made, and uh, sometimes uh, it's issues that involve uh, other people's lives. It might be their career, it might be their health. There are yeah. uh, a number of issues that are that are involved. So uh, I will always caution that uh, whenever it's done, it must be verified it must be done with caution uh, and we can all understand that we're living in um, um, you know new times where uh, it's sort of different from where we were probably a, a, a few years a few years back where ordinary folks they can simply share information but in doing so it is always important that you verify um, you know, whatever you want to share on the different media, uh, rather social media uh, platforms, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Facebook, but it, it is um, uh, quite important that, um, you know, that is always uh, double checked. All right. Well, let's uh, talk to someone who's been in the uh, media business for a while, but uh, 
occasionally tweets on social media and therefore is a citizen journalist. Uh, King Chauke, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Welcome to the program. Um, you've tweeted something recently on social media and it was the case of, a, I think, two boys in a classroom and one was bullying the other. What, what moved you to post that? Because you did get some feedback from some people as well, didn't you? Um, I did. Good morning, uh, Peter, and good morning to all the viewers. Um, definitely, I did get some feedback from different people. Uh, some were threats to say I must delete the video. Um, but above all, it was the reach of the Department of Edu Basic Education to say, can we help them as well to trace the school and the perpetrator? Uh, just to answer your second question, why we posted the video. Uh, I saw it trending on WhatsApps and other platforms. And I kept on investigating to see, does the department know about it? And we found that the department didn't know about it. Mm. But at the same time, the people that had that information were withholding the information. So we decided to go on a social media platform to say, can you help the police trace this perpetrator? To me, it was a criminal element. All right. So there are some things that uh, I guess you have to consider, and sometimes people don't. Uh, did you stop for a moment and think, okay, these kids are schoolgoers, they're underage, should I still post this? Is this something that as uh, retweeters we need to think about more? Uh, Peter, you remember crime is a crime. Mm. And before even thinking about these are young boys that are still school going, it was a crime. And that crime needed to be brought to light. Whether the platform was right or not, we were not getting the information. And if you look at my tweet, it was to say, please help mm. get this perpetrator to prison. To me, right. it was just another way of saying, let's get this to the fore. All right. So, look, uh, we're not pointing fingers at you, but uh, I'm just now asking you to put on the hat of maybe other tweets that you've seen online. I saw one recently of a young girl who was being bullied by another girl. But in this one, it was a bit more graphic. And I felt that by retweeting that video, she was suffering twice. First, by the perpetrator. And then secondly, having her dignity removed because uh, her panties were being pulled away from her. And I just wonder, what are your thoughts about when it starts to get into... Uh, compromising somebody's dignity. Should we, as retweeters, think about that? Um, unfortunately, Peter, you have a different people that retweet video. Mm. Some it uh, in a funny way, not sensitizing the matter that you're trying to raise. If you see the people that we also tagged, it was the police and the Department of Higher Education, Meaning that our aim was to get the boy being bullied help. Mm. All right. Chamano, you've heard uh, um, King Chauke there. A crime was being committed. Uh, and he says that uh, he was trying to alert the authorities. And so it was all with good intention. The other video for me was quite disturbing. I don't know if you saw the schoolgirl that was uh, being bullied by another schoolgirl. I thought that that should not have been shown. Um, and as a news broadcaster, we probably would not have shown that. How do we manage this going forward? Because people a lot of times are just tweeting so that they can get followers. Yeah, so Peter, thanks. Um, and I know that it's a tough balancing act, but uh, maybe just going back to what um, uh, King refers to. So you have a situation where you simply just want to put a meta to the fore. Um, now, it's, I mean, in some cases, it may include uh, kids. Um, so how do you go about it? So, but let me just deal with the first, the first point. And I'm, I'm almost reminded of um, the case of um, 
uh, police br brutality. I mean, we've seen a, a whole lot of them, but let me just point one. Amido Masia, uh, a story like that, um, had it not been for uh, somebody who um, filmed that happening and ultimately putting it uh, either on social media, surely the public was never going to, to know about uh, something like that. So, of course, it will always boil down to, to the intention. What is it that you want to uh, achieve? So, listening to uh, King and everything that he said, so I guess it was a case of trying to get the attention of uh, basic education as well as uh, the police. If it was not because of that, surely nothing was going to nothing was going to to be done about it. But yes, there is also uh, an issue which you are raising, and I agree uh, the dignity of, of of a person. So. I think what is more important and what I'm taking out of this conversation is that um, as um, uh, tweeters, um, uh, as people that uh, always um, uh, share information, let us um, be cautious of what we, you know, uh, tweet about uh, in the case of, um, uh, you know, uh, Twitter. So whatever um, uh, social media platform, let us be cautious of the information we are putting out there. The dignity of other people uh, still still matters the most. But as I said, I mean, it's, um, it's a tough it. balancing. Uh, or, but one or way or the other, we have to find that one. So what I know for sure is that there are laws in place about what you can show, what you can't show. And uh, people don't realize that when you retweet, it doesn't matter whether you weren't the originator, you become an accessory to that. Do you think, and this is a question for both of you, that greater education needs to happen uh, to warn people because they can get prosecuted just for retweeting something that they may not have originated? King Chawuke, your thoughts? Uh, very true, Peter. It, uh, also, it, it goes down to what are your intentions when you retweet the video? And also be cautious of the comments that you're going to put on the video. Mm. Uh, it reminds me of one of the videos that I'm in possession of, of a young girl that was tripped in naked from school, beaten and made to drink her own urine. I can't share such content. Mm. But at the same time, you have to understand what I'm doing with such content. So it is a warning to Twitter users or even social media users. The information that you are disseminating can incriminate you, even though you did not participate in the crime. All right. Gentlemen, unfortunately, we've ah. run out of time. Tamana, we're going to speak to you again a little bit later on when we uh, uh, review the newspapers. So stay with us. But King Chawuke, thanks so much indeed for giving us uh, another perspective on uh, this uh, uh, weighty issue of when to tweet and retweet. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Peter. All right. Okay. So we'll see Chamano again uh, as a little bit later on in the program. And our thanks to King Chawuke there uh, about sharing his thoughts with us. Now, Algerian journalist Khalid Drareni received a two-year prison term at uh, his appeal hearing on Tuesday this week. In a trial, rights uh, uh, groups have called a test of press freedom in a country recently rocked by anti-government protests. Drareni, who's 40, is an editor at the uh, Caspar Tribune uh, news site and a news uh, correspondent for French language channel TV Saint Monde. He had been sentenced to three years in jail in August for his coverage of Algeria's anti government protests. Well, the journalist was arrested on March the 29th on charges of inciting an unarmed gathering and endangering national unity after covering these demonstrations, the Hirak protest uh, movement. Francois Lendo, the uh, manager of uh, local radio uh, Los Anganyana, uh, was arrested on the 15th of September on his way to attending a meeting of the Congolese Journalists Union. 
Lendo, who's still being held, was arrested on a complaint brought against him by Joseph Stefan Mukumadi, who is holding on to the post of uh, Sankuru governor, although the Provincial Assembly voted to remove him from this position and no longer regards him as legitimate. All right, so we bring you those stories every week just to give you an idea of uh, some of the challenges that journalists across the continent are facing in just doing their jobs. All right, so now this week on the 24th of September, South Africa will be celebrating Heritage Day. And this, as you know by now, is an annual holiday where South Africans are encouraged to celebrate their culture and the diversity of their beliefs and traditions. It was first celebrated uh, as Heritage Day in 1996. And we take you back to that day. And this is how the SABC covered the story. Elizabeth Park in Bramfontein, Johannesburg, has been renamed after Enoch Sontonga, composer of Nkosi Sikileli Africa. He was honored during Heritage Day celebrations attended by President Nelson Mandela. The hymn is one of the most recognized in Africa, but not that much is known about its composer. What has finally become known is that Enoch Mankai Sontonga was buried at the Bramfontein Cemetery in 1905. Finding his grave wasn't easy. Entries in the cemetery archives were crude. Archaeological excavations eventually determined the final resting place of the author and composer. Today, it became a national monument. Sontonga was also posthumously honored with the Order of Merit, which was received by his granddaughter. President Mandela then shook hands with each and every member of the choir and orchestra who provided the essential music of the day. But some journalists had a battle to get the president's personal comments about the new national anthem. I'm going to make a formal complaint to the president's office because that is unacceptable. On that side of the flowers, please, you as well. Thank you. It is one of the most powerful instruments that to bring about a United Nations. And uh, it also says, let us forget the past. Let us think of the present and the future. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. President. The old showground road which runs past Bramfontein Cemetery has now become Enoch Sontonga Avenue in memory of a previously unproclaimed national hero. Jessica Pitchford, SABC, Johannesburg. Today marked a special heritage day in Basulu Natal as well. For the first time in the province, people from different cultural backgrounds celebrated the day together. Despite a poor turnout earlier in the day, by midday it was a spectacular show of dance, song and traditional dress. Outside the stadium, security was on full alert. More than 400 policemen, army platoons and members of the internal stability unit monitored proceedings. Most people heeded the ban on dangerous weapons. Party politics and ideological differences were forgotten as Guazulu Natal Premier Dr. Frank Mlalose set the tone of the day. He warmly welcomed Zulu King Goodwill Swelitini, showing little signs of recent tensions between them. We are aware that cultural and religious differences could bring citizens in a state of collision and destabilization. If there are any among us, who show traits of cultural and religious arrogance. This must stop because that will draw greater fire and destabilize our country. The Zulu monarch praised Dr. Mtlalose and ANC provincial leader Jacob Zuma for their dedication to peace and stability. We need to join hands and fight crime. We cannot be held ransom by the criminals. Isolate criminals in your homes. Isolate them in your businesses and in your communities. All the leaders stressed the need for cultural education amongst the people of the country. The celebrations ended peacefully. Tutum Somi, SABC Durban.
Welcome back. It's time now to take a look at uh, what's uh, been on our front pages of our Sunday newspapers here in South Africa. And we're joined once again by Tamaru Makadi, who's a broadcast specialist lecturer at the Tswana University of Technology, himself a long-time media practitioner. Uh, Tamaru, thanks very much again for joining us. Um, let's take a look at these newspapers. And I know that uh, the City Press caught your attention straight away. Why was that? That's right, Peter. The City Press caught my attention with um, the, their story, which is on the front page, uh, with um, uh, the headline, Corrupt List, the Cadres Rejected. So here is a story um, that it's mainly coming from uh, the ranks of the ANC. Um, the NEC, uh, a few weeks back, as you would recall, um, there was um, this suggestion that um, members that might uh, somehow be implicated they may have to uh, step aside from uh, their position, uh, especially those that uh, are holding uh, public offices. So we see uh, a situation here where some um, uh, members, um, uh, leaders uh, in the different provinces, in this case, um, a Northern Cape and MEC, who is basically saying, uh, I am not going to go down uh, without a fight, I am uh, simply going to challenge this in legal in legal terms. So basically, the MEC is arguing the fact that um, uh, the uh, the process or the procedure seem to be unfair and unprocedural. So we are um, uh, definitely just going to watch and see how the ANC is going to manage this one. We know for a fact that uh, when President Cyril Ramaphosa came to uh, office, uh, he came on the card of um, a fighting corruption. So is he going to uh, win this one? But I guess uh, one to watch, really. And it is a difficult one, isn't it? Because you've got, on the one hand, uh, an integrity commission, which is an internal party process. And that works not necessarily on the law by the name of its uh, by the by the fact of its name integrity it's bringing the party into disrepute and so on and so forth and then the party can make decisions about its own members and i also believe that the uh, people are deployed by the party uh, at the party's behest and so in theory they should be able to withdraw their services as well but it seems as if the other sort of law that we are subjected to, proven uh, you're innocent until proven guilty, should be the thing that protects you. So it's a bit of a conundrum, but it's, it's a problem for the party because local government elections are, are coming up and the voters are watching this and making up their minds. If they think someone's corrupt and he's allowed to carry on working, it's a problem. Certainly a conundrum, Peter, because um, um, like you rightfully um, uh, pointed out, uh, on the one hand, uh, you are expected to, you are either guilty until, uh, you know, proven uh, so. So uh, what happens in a situation where uh, these are still allegations? As a party, do you say, step aside do you ask somebody to resign what what do you do and that's exactly the situation at hand here where somebody is basically saying but i have not been proven guilty by the court of law except to say these are uh, you know reports that are playing out in the media in the media space on the one hand you have uh, the public um that have um, a certain expectations about um you know leaders um, so you are right as well to say you have the elections that are coming up. There are people that want to really see, um, you know, uh, the leadership of uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa taking action and not just talk about some of some of these uh, some of these things. So what do you do? It's certainly uh, a conundrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one which is uh, really difficult for uh, the, the ruling party, um, uh, if I may put it so, Peter. All right. Okay. I know one story that uh, you haven't seen because the Sunday Tribune is a Durban newspaper, but I think one that we can talk about is uh, their headline story is 
South Africa needs to get used to the new normal as the alert level goes to one at midnight. And there is a great fear of a second wave. We've seen it in Europe. We've seen it in America where there was an easing of the lockdown restrictions and people didn't carry on doing the things like wearing masks, social distancing, and then there was a second wave. And there is a concern that we might see that here in this country. Yeah, I think it's a bit of um, a, a challenge. Obviously, uh, as we all know, I mean, as of um, uh, tomorrow, should I say midnight, um, we are going on um, alert level one. So I think the emphasis, uh, what we need to get to, you know, the masses uh, uh, here, Peter, is that um, people must always keep in mind that uh, coronavirus is still very much with us. Yes, indeed, uh, the situation is better compared to where we're coming from, and I mean, six months uh, ago. So what I think is very important is also to draw lessons from some of those countries that uh, uh, have faced, um, uh, you know, a situation where uh, this thing all of a sudden sort of uh, resurfaced. Yeah. So we must continue to wear those masks. We must continue to take care of ourselves. All right. And with that, I'll say to you, take care of yourself. And we chat to again soon. Thanks so much indeed, uh, my dear brother. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. All right. Okay. So that's uh, how we come to the end of the program. Thanks very much indeed for tuning in. Uh, it was great having you. And uh, join us again next week at the same time. But remember, it's level one. Yes. But we really have to be even more careful now. And one of those things is wearing a mask. Take care. Bye-bye.